The darkness has always held a certain allure for me. There's something about the stillness of the night, the way it shrouds everything in mystery, that draws me out for walks when most people are tucked away in their homes. Some might find it strange, but for me, it's a chance to embrace the eerie atmosphere and let my mind wander. One of my favorite routes takes me along a four-wheel drive track that winds through a dense wooded area not far from my house. It's a path I know well, but on this particular Friday night, it would lead me to an encounter I won't soon forget. As I ventured into the darkness, the only sounds were the crunch of gravel beneath my feet and the occasional rustle of leaves in the breeze. But then, cutting through the silence like a knife, came a faint scream. At first, I brushed it off as nothing more than kids playing in the distance. But when it echoed through the night once more, I knew something wasn't right. Instinct kicked in, propelling me forward with a sense of urgency. With each step, my heart hammered in my chest, the adrenaline coursing through my veins, heightening my senses. I had to find out what was happening, had to help if I could. As I neared the end of the track, the source of the screams came into view. A young woman, her cries ringing out into the night, held captive by a man twice her age. My blood ran cold as I watched paralyzed for only a moment before springing into action. Without a second thought, I charged forward, the adrenaline drowning out any fear or doubt. The man's grip on the girl loosened as he caught sight of me, his eyes wide with panic before he turned and fled into the darkness. With the immediate threat gone, I rushed to the girl's side, offering whatever comfort and support I could. She was shaken, tears streaming down her face as she clung to me, grateful for the lifeline in the darkness. The arrival of the police brought a sense of relief, their presence bringing order to the chaos of the night. My statement served as a crucial piece of the puzzle, helping to piece together whatever had transpired and ensuring justice for the young woman. In the aftermath of the ordeal, I couldn't shake the feeling of disbelief. The darkness had always been my sanctuary, but tonight it had revealed a darker truth lurking just beyond the shadows. Yet, despite the fear and uncertainty, I refused to let it deter me from my walks. For every moment of darkness, there is also light. And though the memory of that night might haunt me, it serves as a reminder of the strength and resilience that lies within us all, waiting to be called upon in times of need. I was 12 years old when I stayed over at my best friend Carrie's house for the night. We had all sorts of plans for a sleepover, staying up late, listening to music, playing board games, and of course, chatting about boys. It was your typical girl's night in. Around 2 a.m., we were sure her parents were fast asleep. We decided to sneak into the kitchen for a snack. We tiptoed down the hallway from her room, trying our best not to make a sound. But as we passed through the dining room, we heard it, a tapping noise coming from the living room window. We froze, our hearts pounding in our chests, and turned to see a figure standing on the porch outside. Bathed in the glow of the porch light, it looked like a shadowy silhouette. We assumed it was Carrie's sister's boyfriend, who wasn't supposed to be around. We thought maybe he was trying to get her attention in some strange way. We debated what to do, hoping he would leave on his own or that someone would wake up and chase him off. The last thing we wanted was to get caught sneaking around when we were supposed to be asleep. But as we watched, the figure continued tapping at the window and then we saw it, a glint of metal in his hand. It was a knife. Panic surged through us as we realized the danger we were in. Without another thought, we dropped to the floor and crawled as quietly as we could into the kitchen. Once we reached the safety of the kitchen, we huddled together, whispering frantically about what to do next. We knew we had to get to her parents' room, but that meant crossing through the living room where the man with the knife was. We peeked around the corner and saw him still standing on the porch. We couldn't risk him seeing us, so we needed a plan. That's when we remembered the broken sliding glass door in the dining room, right next to where we were hiding. We decided to crawl back to Carrie's room, hoping to find a way to lock the door and stay safe. But as we made our way, we heard the front door knob rattling. Fear gripped us as we realized he was trying to get in. We scrambled back to her room and locked the door then crept to her window facing the street to see if he was still there. Thankfully, he was gone. 
but the image of him with that knife was burned into my mind. We finally worked up the courage to tell her parents what had happened, but they dismissed it as our overactive imaginations. Reluctantly, we went back to her room and barricaded ourselves in for the rest of the night. The next morning, Carrie's dad returned from the store with chilling news. The clerk had been stabbed to death. It sent shivers down my spine, realizing just how close we had come to danger. So to the knife-tapping psycho, let's never, ever meet again. About four years ago, I landed a job at one of the largest theme parks in the UK. Situated just half an hour away from my home, this place holds a special spot in many hearts. Though I won't name it directly, I'm sure some of you can guess which one I'm talking about. My role at the park was as a ride assistant, and I had the opportunity to work on various attractions, including three of the big coasters and a couple of dark rides. For those unfamiliar, a dark ride is essentially an indoor attraction, with the most common example being a ghost train. One of the rides I worked on was set within the ruins of the family estate from which the park derives its name. It told a local legend about the cursed family that once owned the estate, adding an eerie touch to the park's atmosphere. The actual ruins were known for their spooky reputation, even featuring on programs like Most Haunted. And let me tell you, after spending time on that ride, I can attest to the unsettling vibes that permeate the place. One October night, during the park's extended hours, I found myself stationed at the end of the queue line for the ride. My role was to manage the flow of guests and greet them as they arrived. Usually, after 5 p.m., the ride would become deserted, as most visitors preferred to thrill the roller coasters in the dark. My job was pretty straightforward. With a small station equipped with a television screen showing security camera feeds, and a direct phone line to the ride operator's cabin. The cameras covered the outdoor entrance, the entire queue line, and the cinema area, leaving no blind spots. On this particular night, as I went about my usual routine of monitoring the queue and keeping an eye on the screens, I spotted what appeared to be a young couple making their way towards me. I quickly pocketed my phone and prepared to greet them. But as they approached, they vanished in the thin air, leaving me bewildered. There was no way they could have left the room without passing me or opening one of the heavy fire doors. The eerie sensation that washed over me sent shivers down my spine, and I couldn't help but feel uneasy until a co-worker arrived to relieve me from my break. While that incident was unsettling, it wasn't the only strange occurrence I experienced at the park. Throughout my life, I had my fair share of paranormal encounters, so I've developed a sense for when something is amiss. One particular area of the ride, known as the Octagon Room, always gave me an unsettling feeling. This large chamber was the final section of the ruins that guests passed through before exiting the ride. Due to a broken machine, one ride assistant was tasked with standing behind a thick curtain in the pitch blackness and pulling it back after each show to reveal a secret tunnel for guests to follow. More often than not, this duty fell to me and I found myself enjoying the darkness and the element of surprise as I scared unsuspecting guests. However, there were moments when an overwhelming sense of dread would wash over me, accompanied by the feeling of a malevolent presence lurking just behind me. Despite the fear, I stood my ground, refusing to let it drive me away. I wasn't alone in feeling this presence. Several female co-workers reported being pushed or pinched while working in the area. Despite the eerie occurrences, I found myself drawn to the octagon room, embracing the intensity of the experience, even as I heard the haunting sounds of cackling and whispers echoing in the darkness. It was a chilling reminder of the mysteries that lurk within the shadows of the park. My sister's house is probably the most actively haunted place I've ever experienced. It doesn't really bother my sister or me too much because we both grew up in a haunted house, so we're somewhat used to the unexplained. But when it comes to my brother-in-law and the kids, it's a whole different story. Within just two weeks of moving in, my sister saw a full-bodied apparition standing in the dining room. It was the figure of an older man wearing a large brimmed hat and a vest. Two weeks later, my brother-in-law saw the same man and he did not take it well. 
considering he's terrified of ghosts. Then about a month later, it happened again to my brother-in-law, but this time the man was standing in the entryway to the house, visible through the screen door. He stayed in this car until my sister got home. My brother-in-law is no coward, but I think he draws a line at things he can't punch. My sister and brother-in-law acquired the house from their friends, who were the previous occupants. When they asked them if they had experienced anything strange while living there, their response was matter-of-fact. Oh, did you see the man? Obviously, the previous occupants had seen the entity regularly to give such a nonchalant response, as if they were an old friend of theirs or something. I was oblivious to these happenings until my sister and brother-in-law told me about them. I became intrigued and offered to check it out since I was going to be at their house anyway to help hang sheetrock. When I got there, only my brother-in-law was home, and he told me about the footsteps that had recently started. I used to do ghost hunting as a hobby back in the day, but I'd never heard ghostly footsteps before. I was a little excited, to be honest. We started cutting and hanging sheetrock in the kitchen when, sure enough, I clearly heard someone walking around right above my head on the second floor. I looked at my brother-in-law with a smirk and said, Are you serious, dude? He responded, Happens all the time now. A chill ran up my spine, but we continued working, all the while listening to the unmistakable sound of heavy footfalls and shuffling up above our heads. Suddenly, the footsteps and shuffling stopped, and it stayed quiet for about ten minutes. Then, we heard a slamming sound that shook the floor. That rattled us both. The only thing that could have made that sound were the old, heavy wooden cellar doors outside. I told my brother-in-law we had to go check it out, and understandably, he wasn't a huge fan of the idea. My main concern was the off chance that someone broke in to steal stuff, so I grabbed a claw hammer and told him to back me up if things got real. My hands were shaking as we pulled open the cellar doors and descended into the musty old basement. We searched every inch of the basement, but there was no one down there. At least, no one we could see. Again, I got to chill up my spine and got the heck out of there. That was my first experience in that house. A few months later, I offered to stay overnight and record the basement with a baby monitor. Not high tech, but it gets the job done. I set the baby monitor up in an area of the basement that gave me the creepiest feelings. I watched it using my laptop and recorded roughly 16 hours of footage. I never caught anything on video, but the audio was very interesting and a bit unnerving. There was constant, barely audible murmuring, even into the early morning hours when everyone, including me, had long gone to sleep. It sounded like numerous individuals were having a conversation they didn't want anyone to hear. Oddly, the activity came to a halt with no explanation, and the house was quiet for about a year until recently. The things that happened now put me on edge a bit because I've seen things in broad daylight that I can't explain. On two occasions, I've seen what looks like a woman walking through the front yard towards the back of the house. But when I went to check it out, there was no one there. One of the kids experienced something almost identical, but far more terrifying not long after. One of my nephews was playing in the backyard in the afternoon when a woman's head peeked around the backside of the house and was staring at him. My nephew panicked and ran behind one of the cars in the driveway. A few seconds later, he heard walking up the outside stairwell leading up to the second floor, but he couldn't see anyone physically up there. I find this distressing because all the activity before seemed random, as if the ghosts weren't aware of our presence. But now, it seems like they are quite aware. It has quieted down a bit, but this house has its ebbs and flows. I pray the ghosts don't try making physical contact next. <laughs>